My first topic this evening is my great-grandfather, William Frederick Pendleton, who, along with other early families, moved to the Alnwick Grove settlement. My goal is to present a glimpse into the early life of a boy, and later a man, whose experiences coincided with momentous events in the life of our nation. If you've come to hear about W.F. Pendleton's life in Bernathan as a bishop of the church, you're at the wrong talk. I believe the most significant experience of my grandfather's life was the Civil War. He lived in turbulent, desperate times, filled with the savagery of war, the Holocaust of slavery, and the beginning of a religious movement which still struggles today to grow with the vision he laid down at its founding. The fact that he survived skirmishes, maneuvers, and so many battles is testimony not only to a merciful providence, but a purposed mind, the determination of which I can only guess. How could he have experienced the repeated onslaught of battle after battle, serious injury, recovery, and the continued fighting for a desperate and hopeless cause during the most formative years of his life without the consequence of their impact being so important? In contemplating my great-grandfather's life, the three issues that most intrigued me were the institution of slavery, the aftermath of emancipation, and the struggle during Reconstruction. How had these momentous events affected him over the course of his 82 years? Human intellect is limited and conditioned by our time and place, as well as by other factors. It is outside of the bounds of historical authenticity to impose the moral sensibilities of our own time onto those living in an earlier era. Yet, how can we separate political and social norms from moral judgments? Particularly, how could an institution like slavery have been accepted, condoned, and practiced by a family who believed in Swedenborg's message from the Age of Enlightenment enshrined in a revelatory annunciation. But let me begin by painting a picture of what came before, for our antecedents form us all. From the time of stepping off a tiny ship at Jamestown Harbor in 1674 as bond servants in payment for their passage, each time a younger Pendleton didn't inherit under the English laws of primogenitor, they moved. First, from Jamestown Harbor and Settlement, where Philip and his brother, the Anglican priest Nathaniel, had begun colonial life. <laughs> to Williamsburg. Then, to the northern neck of the Potomac and Caroline County, where Edmund Pendleton, Speaker of the Colonial House of Burgesses and later Chief Justice of the Commonwealth, established their patrimony. then to Culpeper, to Winchester, to Savannah, Georgia, and to a wilderness town founded by W.F.'s father, Philip Coleman Pendleton, in 1857, which he named Tabeauville, after W.F.'s maternal grandfather, Frederick Edmund Tabeau. It is now called Waycross, Georgia. Finally, the family moved to nearby Valdosta, on the cusp of the great Okefenokee Swamp. The Pendletons were cotton farmers in the red Georgia clay on a farm they hacked out of the piney woods in the swamp. Like many larger landowners, they were only able to farm with the help of slave labor. The enslavement of African Americans in what became the United States 
formally began during the 1630s. And at that time, colonial courts and legislatures made clear that Africans, unlike white indentured servants as the first Pendletons in America had been, served their masters for life and that their slave status would be inherited by their children. De facto emancipation came to the northern states by around 1820. While there was, certainly, an activist abolitionist movement during that time, in fact, the main demand for the abolition of slavery in the North came not from those who found it morally wrong, but from white working class men who did not want slaves as rivals for their jobs. Lest we forget James Carville's adage from Bill Clinton's first presidential campaign, it's the economy, stupid. That motif was true then in the mid-1800s as it is now. The southern states were much more dependent on agriculture than were the northern ones. Much of the wealth of Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, the Carolinas, and Georgia came from the cash crops that slaves grew. The economic imperative for slavery existed because there simply were not enough white southerners to do the backbreaking labor required to produce tobacco, cotton, rice, and sugar, which were the region's chief crops. As a consequence of these factors, the southern states were determined to retain slavery after the revolution. Thus began the fatal division between free states and slave states that led to sectionalism and ultimately to civil war. The Pendleton Farm was just on the outskirts of Valdosta, Georgia in Lowndes County. And my cousin Albert, when he was alive, would tend the graves of WF's father, Philip Coleman Pendleton, and his wife, Catherine, along with those children who stayed behind and did not move north. Indeed, there are many Pendleton cousins still living in Valdosta. All during his life and extending into his children's generation, W.F. was tied to his southern family, his roots, as evidenced by records of their regular travel back to their ancestral home. By that particularly cold December in 1861, the time of Lincoln's first State of the Union address, W.F.'s father, Philip, who had fought in the Seminole Indian Wars in Florida, was in rebellion and helping to form the 50th Georgia Volunteer Regiment. W.F. had turned 16 a month before the shelling of Fort Sumter in April of that year. At the beginning of the war, he was still too young to carry a gun in those early, more innocent days of the conflict. By the end of the war, he was 20 and a captain, decorated for valor and wounded in battle. was all the fighting about? As so frequently happens in the beginning of conflicts, one thing leads to another as the combatants stumble toward war. So it was with the Civil War. The dithering President Buchanan asserted secession was, on the one hand, illegal. But he believed going to war to stop it was also illegal. Buchanan, as a former Secretary of State, had learned the fine art of an oblique turn of phrase, saying nothing, doing nothing. 
he had made promises he did not keep. South Carolina Governor Pickens believed that Buchanan had implicitly promised that federal troops would not occupy Sumter, the island fort defending the entrance of Charleston Harbor. As a result of this misunderstanding and a perceived breach of faith, the South Carolina militia bombarded the fort while Navy supply ships steamed south from Washington to its rescue. Whatever Hillary Clinton is thinking about her future in presidential politics, I simply note that no Secretary of State has become president since James Buchanan. So, was this long-simmering distrust that blossomed into war all about states' rights? In a way it was, but only insofar as this manifested the rights of the states to enforce their property in the fugitive slave laws. By the time of the Civil War, the experience of 230 years of slavery in America had brought with it the law of unintended consequences. The rural nature of antebellum slavery had unintended negative effects on the southern economy. The investment of so much capital in land and slaves discouraged the growth of cities and diverted funds from factories. This meant that the South lacked the industrial base it needed to counter the North when the Civil War began. Rather than living the long-held colonial dream of Jeffersonian democracy, the South was agrarian only because slave owners found it the best way to maintain their wealth and preserve their slave property. The consequences of planter dominance were seen in many aspects of society. The South failed to develop a varied economy even within the agricultural discipline. All the most fertile land in the South was owned by slaveholders who chose to narrowly grow high-profit staple crops, cotton, tobacco, sugar. That concentration of wealth left only marginal land for the vast majority of less prosperous white farmers. These white farmers, the other 99% in today's jargon, used some of their land to grow food for their family's consumption and devoted the rest to cash crops like cotton. This was the dream of the Pendletons. Like modern real estate speculators of just a few years ago, their hope was to produce enough beyond their needs to save, buy a few slaves, produce yet more, buy some more slaves, and ultimately accumulate the wealth that would elevate them to planter status. For them and most of their neighbors, this was a futile dream, but they remained committed to it thereby neglecting other possible avenues for economic advancement. Until it all came crashing down and the dire effects of war and reconstruction forced them into other avenues of enterprise. W.F. fought in some of the most arduous campaigns of the war. Chancellorsville Gettysburg Winchester The Shenandoah Valley Campaign Cedar Creek On October 19, 1864, Confederate Lieutenant General Jubal Early and Union Major General Philip Sheridan met in a decisive battle on these fields. W.F. Pendleton, in the thick of battle, received a head wound and was removed to the nearby Wayside Inn for treatment. The Height Farmhouse, near where W.F. was wounded in the left temple at the Battle of Cedar Creek, October 19th, 1864. 
It was here that the final Confederate invasion of the North was effectively ended. The Confederacy was never able again to threaten Washington, D.C., nor protect any of its key economic bases in Virginia. The stunning Union victory aided the re-election of Abraham Lincoln and Sheridan won lasting fame. Second Manassas Berryville Petersburg and the Wilderness, to name but a few of the major campaigns. It is important to remember that the initial northern goal of the war was not emancipation, but rather the speedy restoration of the Union under the Constitution and the laws of 1861, all of which recognized the legitimacy of slavery. Lincoln knew interfering with slavery would make reunion more difficult. Thus, Union generals like George B. McClellan in Virginia were ordered not only to defeat the southern armies, which they did not do very quickly, but also to prevent slave insurrections, which they did. I was surprised to learn that in the first months of the war, slaves who escaped to the Union lines were returned to their masters in conformity with the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. In his memoirs, W.F. describes loyal family retainers who stayed with the family throughout the war. But this loyalty was, by and large, a delusion. When given the option, slaves made it very clear that they wanted freedom. The vast majority of slaves, however, remained on their plantations in the countryside. Nevertheless, even these slaves in the southern interior found ways to demonstrate their desire for freedom. Their behavior could be described as the first massive labor slowdown in American history. They did not cease to work, but they contrived to do considerably less than they had before the war. As a result, despite early victories on the battlefield, the economy of the South experienced immediate recession. In the end, slaves played a major role in bringing down the Confederacy. They had demonstrated that they wanted freedom and were prepared to fight and resist their shackles for its realization. Despite the masterful propaganda victory of the Emancipation Proclamation, the legal end to slavery in the nation came only in December 1865 when the 13th Amendment was ratified. The war ended in various places during the spring and summer of 1865, and the long period of Reconstruction began, lasting 13 years until 1878. This period of hardship reduced the South to Stone Age economic conditions caused by the ravages of war and a brutal occupying army, and it brought many challenges to the Pendleton family. Since many of their slaves left the farm at the end of the war, the family was incapable of planting and harvesting the cotton crop. W.F.'s brother, the author Louis Pendleton, wrote a piece of fiction. Describing one character, transparently his older brother, W.F., Louis describes the character as someone who had his head in the clouds, studied Hebrew and Greek, rather than tending to his responsibilities as the oldest son on the farm. During this time, their father, Major Pendleton, purchased an old printing press from a printer in Savannah. With this equipment, 
He founded and published the South Georgia Times in Valdosta on March 20, 1867. The Times was a weekly, six columns wide and only four pages. The first edition sold for 10 cents a copy or $3 for an annual subscription, quote, invariably in advance. Louis Pendleton's story of the family's plight during Reconstruction is revealing. It has a message for our own time and our current conflicts abroad about how insurgency can fester, born out of a resentment among an occupied population as the result of actions by a brutal invading force wherever it might be. But it also raised questions for me about how the Pendleton family looked upon slavery after the war. These are questions without simple, or in some cases, even available answers. As a result of the hardships of Reconstruction and without the slave labor to support the enterprise, the family abandoned the farm after their father's death in 1869 and moved into the town of Valdosta, where they ran the newspaper their father had started. Fortunately, the family had the South Georgia Times to help make men ends meet. Worthless land holdings, a vanished investment in slave labor, worthless currency, political disenfranchisement, martial law, skyrocketing unemployment, and a censored press spelled disaster for the entire region. It makes our most recent experience with recession rather mild in comparison. Unable to find work after the war, 20-year-old William still had to finish high school. His academic career had been interrupted in the 10th grade. Because there were few work opportunities for anyone who had participated in the rebellion, he attended the Valdosta Institute as a boarding student. Here is where Pendleton first saw his future wife, Lawson Young. Apparently, it was love at first sight for both of them, even though she was only 14. They courted for six years and then were married. It is interesting that their courtship was so long. This was apparently at the insistence of Lawson's father, Reamer Young. He wrote to W.F. on April 6, 1868. Dear Sir, I will use the pen to answer your request of last night. I have spoken to Lawson. I can only make a conditional surrender to you. If in three years' time you prove to be worthy of my Lawson, I will consent for her to be yours, and never will I consent unless you are. The matter is now with you, and in your power to claim as yours one of the best that ever breathed. It's also as easy for you to lose the same. Will you, or will you not? A man's life is frequently formed by the influences of his wife. In this case, my great-grandfather, W.F. Pendleton, eventually married into the fierce Scots-Irish family of the Youngs, whose motto was fight, sing, drink, pray. In 1736, the Youngs had arrived to our shores from the Ulster Plantation of Scots, who had been encouraged by the British government to settle Northern Ireland. They moved up the Delaware River to Bucks County. From Bucks, they moved up the Susquehanna and Cumberland Valleys, finding flat lands along the rivers and creeks to set up their log cabins, their grist mills, and their Presbyterian churches. Chester and Lancaster counties became their strongholds, and they helped build towns such as Chambersburg, Gettysburg, Carlisle, and York. The next generation moved into western Pennsylvania, with large numbers of children, 
who needed their own inexpensive farms, the Youngs avoided areas already settled by Germans and Quakers and moved south down the Shenandoah Valley and through the Blue Ridge Mountains into Virginia. They followed the Great Wagon Road from Lancaster through Gettysburg and down through Stanton to Big Lick, now Roanoke, Virginia. Here, the pathway split with the Wilderness Road taking settlers west into Tennessee and Kentucky, while the main road they took continued south into the Carolinas and finally Georgia. These mountain people Notable for the red bandanas they wore around their neck, from which we get the modern appellation redneck, were the heroes of the crucial Revolutionary War battle of Kings Mountain in Western North Carolina on October 7, 1780. Lawson Young's ancestor, Thomas Young, was 16 years old during the battle and wrote his recollection of the fierce fighting. From his vivid account, we gain a first-hand appreciation of the personalized violence of war. I well remember how I behaved. Ben Hollingsworth and I took right up the side of the mountain, fought our way from tree to tree up to the summit. I recollect I stood behind one tree and fired till the bark was nearly all knocked off and my eyes pretty well filled with it. One fellow shamed me pretty close for his bullet took a piece out of my gun stock. Before I was aware of it, I found myself apparently between my own regiment and the enemy. As I judged from seeing the paper which the Whigs were in their hats and the pine knots the toy were in theirs, these being the badges of distinction. Engaged to Lawson Young and still unable to find work, W.F. went on to the Savannah Medical College and was awarded an M.D. degree in 1870. This was the year after his father died in a buggy accident, carrying the youngest son, Nathaniel, who survived being thrown from the carriage unharmed. But W.F.'s heart was never in medicine. He had experienced a spiritual renewal during the war in camp meetings not an uncommon experience among those who suffered trauma and loss during the conflict. His father had read the writings of Swedenborg during the war and accepted them by 1863 when he gave up attending the local Methodist church in Valdosta. By the end of 1870, after a year of medical practice with his uncle, Dr. Edmund Pendleton, in Sparta, W.F. decided to pursue the ministry in the New Jerusalem Church Theological School in Waltham, Massachusetts. The event was not without controversy and dissent within the family, especially from his uncle Edmund and his grandmother, Hulda Lewis Tabeau. From their respective perches in Sparta and Savannah, they united to try and win W.F. back into the fold through arguments made to his mother, Catherine. Fortunately for us, they were unsuccessful in their persuasions. W.F. moved to Massachusetts, where the founder of the New Jerusalem Church Seminary was the Reverend Thomas Worcester, a firm abolitionist. Worcester believed the doctrine of freedom and Swedenborg's position on the evil of self-love supported the anti-slavery view. He cited Divine Providence number 138, No one is reformed in states which are not of liberty. Doubtless, W.F. also met and was affected by the writing and sentiment of people like the distinguished jurist Theophilus Parsons, a founder of the Boston Swedenborgian Church and dean of the Harvard Law School. Parsons argued that the doctrines of freedom, use, and regeneration were not compatible with the slaveholders' theological arguments. He wrote that the love of slavery has no other origin than the love of dominion. He scoffed at the notion that slave owners were benevolent protectors of helpless Africans, 
a sentiment even the abolitionist preacher Richard de Charms had proclaimed from a Swedenborgian pulpit in the nation's capital in 1849. Parsons pointed out that the degree to which slave owners protect slaves is not, quote, because of slavery, but in despite of it. And Parsons refuted the common slave owner's argument that African Americans were inferior beings in need of white assistance by affirming the humanity of Africans. He disagreed with those asserting slaves as happy in their current protected position by saying, Fear and habit have great power. Thus, with conflicting influences, W.F. began his life as priest and later a bishop of first the Academy Movement under William Benade and still later as the executive bishop of the General Church. But, like I said at the beginning, I'm not here to tell that story, so I can only depart this incomplete narrative with unanswered questions. I wonder how W.F. would have responded to some of them in the gentle lilt of his southern accent. For by all reports, he was a gentle man. April 12, 1961, America celebrated the centennial of the beginning of the war between the states by commemorating the bombardment of Fort Sumter. But long before that, the media began to build excitement with all sorts of information about how the Civil War would be celebrated and remembered. Commemoration activities had begun four years prior, in 1957, and ended with the 100th anniversary of the surrender at Appomattox on April 12, 1965. The increasing excitement in those days in Bernathan, this hill of cohesion, gave rise to our own Civil War reenactments from the spring to fall 1961 to 1962 during my years in fifth and part of sixth grade. A classmate, Gray Schoenberger Glenn, termed it a grand finale of childhood before the boy girl thing awakened in our class. She said, Playing Civil War, we all still belong to each other. In many ways, it was a magical time. If credit is to be given for the germ of this idea that galvanized scores of children to leave their indolent summer daydreams and become involved in living history, it should be given to Hugh Gyllenhaal whose family had moved to Bernathan in the summer of 1960 and whose son, Stephen, had just joined our fifth grade class. Stephen was in a leg cast from a torn ligament. He needed assistance with his assigned duty of raising the flag each morning in front of the elementary school building. Our teacher, Mrs. Welkley, assigned me to carry the flag while Stephen negotiated the path from our classroom to the flagpole on crutches. It was during these brief moments, invisible from Mrs. Welkley's strict observations while raising the flag, that we hatched and argued about the details of Stephen's father's grand idea. First, we argued about who should command the Union 
and who the Confederate side. Given that the actual historical outcomes had already been predetermined, what fifth grader wants to be on the losing side? On account of the close blood relationships occasioned by a small church and even smaller community, it turned out Stephen was also related to W.F. Pendleton through Stephen's paternal grandmother, Philo Pendleton, the daughter of W.F.'s brother, Charles. Nonetheless, Stephen had no special interest in marshalling the losing side. He told me defiantly that Gyllenhaals would have been Yankees had they arrived in America early enough to decide. In contrast, for me, there was no choice other than playing the part of a Confederate. Although my maternal grandmother was also a Gyllenhaal, my aunts, W.F.'s daughters, lived only three houses from me on Alnwick Road, and I had only recently secured the job of cutting their plantation-sized lawn every week for three dollars. So the duties of filial obligation, intergenerational solidarity, and financial security made my choice clear. The word spread quickly through the student body in elementary school. From the outset, every Friday after school, which in those days ended at noon, and in summer every day, we would gather in the dense woods and sparse cleared fields being prepared for excavation as the Pine Run Park subdivision, and wage war until the approaching dusk, hunger, and exhaustion sent us to our homes. first battles followed the lessons we were studying in class about the Civil War. We tried to organize the fighting and outcome according to the history of each battle. Though mostly well planned, these early skirmishes showed that our assembled troops needed discipline and a chain of command. It was a great experience for fifth graders learning to deal with volunteers, cajoling, begging, demanding, threatening. Motivating, leading, following. Useful skills learned by us all. Establishing the officer corps was a good lesson in how the fickle bonds of friendship and the cliquishness of elementary school are not the best guides for raising classmates to positions of power over peers and underclassmen. But through the squabbling and unfortunate displays of democracy among the troops, who resisted absolute command. We managed to cobble together something that resembled more than a gang of boys attended by beautiful nurses and younger camp followers. We started to fashion esprit de corps and a certain pride of clan. And this was even true of the feckless Union troops from across the pike. Indeed, we started to see desertions from some of the children in College Park on the Union side to the glorious Southern cause. Oh, she's the sweetest 
The Pine Run Park location was convenient to Stevens' house on Byberry Road. But those of us from the other side of town, the Loop, comprising Alnwick Road and South Avenue, along with Alden, and all the small roads off Fetter's Mill, were at a disadvantage on account of our distance from the field of battle. Nevertheless, Stephen argued that it was more accessible for the hordes of kids who lived in College Park to reach his battlefield. That was until Marvin Clymer's mother let all the other mothers know that she wasn't going to permit Marvin to play in Garth's Gulch because it was covered with poison ivy and Marvin had the blisters to prove it. The order of battle then switched to the poison ivy free zone of woods and fields bordered by Alnwick Road, Quarry Road, and the train tracks of the Newtown local line. The Confederate headquarters were established between a gigantic boulder and the grove of pine trees up Olnwick Road from the post office behind what is now the Maddox House. Every Friday, we would wait for the onslaught of Union troops as they marched from the outlier sides across 2nd Street Pike. I can remember the nervous excitement we all felt before each battle when our forward pickets returned with news of the approaching marauders. Out of breath, our spies would excitedly report on the hordes of children marching simultaneously in a pincer movement down Alnwick Road and South Avenue along the sidewalks made bumpy by the encroaching roots of mature maples. One of the last major battles of our protracted conflict 
started near what was then Sanford Odner's A-frame house, bordering 2nd Street Pike. True to form, the superior Union forces pushed the smaller Confederate army into retreat along the pike and down Alden Road to the Bielert House at the corner of Alden and Fetter's Mill. Then, behind what was the Charles de Charms House, up through the open fields facing Alnwick Road. We crossed Alnwick Road seeking refuge among the massive pines and thick woods. We kept retreating until we reached the cliffs overlooking the train tracks. Our backs to the cliffs, there was no escape. It was during this retreat that the only real casualty of the war took place. Greg Horrigan fell over the cliffs and landed on the thin shards of mica rocks below. He lay inert for a while as Lockie Brown, Artie Rose, and Scott Cooper and I scrambled down the flinty cliffs to investigate his fate. After a moment, Greg propped himself up on an elbow and proclaimed his return to good health. Nobody stayed dead very long during those battles anyway. Then he said he had to pee, and he went off to a nearby bush. Within a few moments, he summoned us with a quaking voice to come see his red urine. Several of us gathered around and watched the strange sight. It can't be good, Scott Cooper sagely remarked, presaging his future as an EMT. Alas, an adult had to be informed. The battle ended with Greg being taken to see my mother, a real nurse. She called Marion Horrigan, who whisked Greg off to medical care, only to discover he had a bruised kidney with no lasting effect. For most of two summers, Bernathan's children were so occupied with the strenuous conduct of civil war that there was no time for mischief. Even the police commented on the lack of juvenile pranks and minimum general lawlessness during this period. Many alive in Bernathan 50 short years ago remember those summers. And then it was over. The nation, emerging from the sleepy comfort of the Eisenhower era, experienced a time of great growth, prosperity, and change. Celebrating the centennial of the Civil War, there was a sense of confidence, promise, an infinite possibility, reinforced by the expanding concrete interstate highways, joining farms and hamlets with big cities and people with each other. There was a fullness to life, a soft reassurance, even in the face of mounting tensions with the Soviet Union. All too soon, we would experience a decade of anxiousness bracketed by the Cuban Missile Crisis and the Tet Offensive in Vietnam. But before all that evil was visited upon the world, we would put away childish things and stop playing games. Way down in Dixie, oh, do they miss me down along the Dixie line? Banjos are strung. Can't you hear? 